Uh, as we're studying 1 Peter, I want to start by reminding ourselves where we've been in the book. Uh, this has been our outline. We're in the first section, the theological introduction. Peter reminds them that God has chosen them for salvation from eternity past. He then moves into the blessings of salvation, uh, showing how God should be praised. We all, as children of God, should be praising and blessing God because of the merciful rebirth that he's given us, living hope that he's given us, security through faith that he's given us, that he's provided, the permanent joy that he's given us because of our relationship and our salvation, and then the witness of both the Old Testament prophets and the angels, how this is a precious salvation. Uh, that was the blessing of salvation. And then he moves for pretty much the rest of the book into the application. So what? Now that we've looked at the blessings, how should it affect our lives? And the first topic, the first thing that he goes into is holiness, where he's so far covered motivations and a fervent love. But let's zoom in there uh, and, and look at that. Uh, first, he gives a positive motivation, uh, which is to fix our hope on the future grace and rest. And until, until then, we're at work. Uh, we're not resting here on earth. We have a job to do. Uh, uh, but we have that hope. We have that promise. And it's that promise and that's hope of the future grace that can help us get through today and live holy lives. Uh, it suggests that our holy lives that we're living today is costly. And in fact, that's what uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, that if there's no resurrection, then we of all people should be most pitied. Uh, because of the sacrifice and the difficulty of living holy lives. Uh, secondly, though, he gives uh, positive motivation is to be holy since by grace you become children of a holy father. Uh, our, our father in heaven is holy, uh, and therefore we, as being given the privilege of becoming his children, being adopted into his family, we also should be holy. Next, he gave us a negative motivation, which is to live in fear of being disciplined by that loving and holy father. Also of dishonoring the cost that he, the great cost that it cost him in order to bring us into, the, into his family. And then we want to be fearful uh, that we don't oppose his intentions, what he's planned for us, his good things. We want to make sure that we are completely in line. And when we say, we talk about fearing God as a believer, we're talking about that reverence, that awe, that, that fear of that we could somehow offend him or break our fellowship with him or break our relationship. Uh, we don't fear him as far as punishment or, or a loss of salvation uh, because we've already learned how that is permanent in the blessings of salvation. And then last week, uh, we looked at the command, which was to fervently love one another from a heart unto a family, a family love, a familial love. Now this passage that we studied last week, uh, the passage for today builds on that on every concept there. It kind of gives the next step. So we need to first remind ourselves of the content of that passage. In the beginning there, verse, 120, uh, verse 21, it says, Since you have, in obedience to the truth, purified your souls for sincere love of the brethren, well, then therefore fervently love one another from the heart. Uh, what it was saying there was, since you purified your souls, or better, your lives, since you purify your lives, uh, which is a reality that began in salvation. Uh, believing the gospel was that first act of obedience uh, that brought you into a new existence. And that existence now continues, where we continually exist as a new children of God, where we continually purify our, our souls, our lives, by continually obeying the truth as we learn more and more of his truth. Uh, the goal was brother, the love of the brethren, which is Philadelphia. It's a brotherly love, a relational, a family love. It's a warm devotion to a mutual love of the members of a family. Uh, and the goal of brotherly love is the reason why we are supposed to, we must, genuinely and fervently love one another. This love is agape love. That's that attitude, uh, an expression of what's right and what's good for the other, for the glory of God. And this is the means by which we will build that family love. So uh, the goal is brotherly love, and the way we get there, the means is that genuine and fervent love for one another. And we grow in that love for one another. We, we learn that by we continually obeying the truth, and thus we continually purify ourselves. Uh, so Peter also speaks of the eternal character 
of the holy life of love in the next two, three verses, which says, For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is, through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. And the grass withers, and the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word, the same word, which was preached to you. So God causes us to be born again through the preaching of his word, his eternal word. Uh, that is, when we began to obey its truth, God's eternal life and his character began to grow in us. We have new life, spiritual life. He calls us to be born again. And God's word, his truth, is that seed that produced that new life. And so now this, uh, this passage here uh, emphasizes the new life that was brought about, that sprouted up because of God's word. This week, Peter takes the next step and writes about the holiness of growing in love. It focuses not on the new life, but it's on that, the growth of that new life. So in this passage, Peter uses two images, two metaphorical images that, to show how a believer grows in holiness. Uh, and grows in holiness, which is expressed in our love for one another. Now first, let's read the whole passage uh, so we can see uh, the, the forest before we get into the trees. The whole passage that we're going to study today says, Therefore, putting aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and, and envy and all slander, like newborn babes, long for the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. All right, the first image that Peter uses is the image of clothing in verse 1 where he says, therefore, putting aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. The verb putting aside, it gives the picture of discarding a, a piece of clothing. Put aside, just like a piece of clothing, you're done with it. And Peter lists five things that should be discarded. Now, these five things are given specifically uh, because these five things inhibit the bond of brotherly love. Uh, to which we, as believers, are committed. Uh, so since the preeminent character, uh, characteristic of a Christian is to love one another, to love the brethren, Jesus said, you'll know that they're my disciples for the love for one another. Uh, if that is true, if that's our preeminent uh, characteristic, then we must remove everything that is contrary. So th here, Peter gives us five major things that are contrary, that, that stop the brotherly love, that unity, the family bond. First in Peter's list is, is malice. This is a general term. It's a wide term. It means wicked, to be wicked. Uh, Mean-spirited and have a vicious attitude towards another. It's a feeling of hostility and a strong dislike of someone else. And it can imply that because of that dislike, you want to cause them harm. Uh, so you can see how that doesn't really go along with it, building a brotherly love and a unity in people. Uh, what is this saying is that the people of God should feel safe together, should be welcomed, should be valued among e each other. Uh, we need to view each other as God views us. Um, now it says all malice, meaning every kind that you can think of, any kind of hostility that we might have in our heart and our attitude towards others, get rid of it, drop it. That won't add to or help you in unity, and it won't help the rest of the body to have that brotherly love. The next term is all deceit. Now, this is not the typical word for deceit, which is uh, pseudos, false, falsehood lying. Uh, this, is, this word for deceit means to take advantage of someone through craft or trickery or falsehood, underhanded methods. Um, now, when we talk about love and brotherly love, love is based on trust. Uh, and thus to take advantage of someone by tricking them doesn't build trust or show love. Uh, so that is something that has to be discarded as well. We can't try to deceive people to take advantage of themselves because what, what is that? It's selfishness, right? It's trying to get, take from others and get for yourself. And once again, it's all kinds. Any kind of thing that you do that where you're putting your own interests above and others, and you're deceitfully in, tr in trying to trick them to get what you want. 
Third item is hypocrisy. Now, the hypocrisy in Greek there is plural. So it's hypocrisies or acts of hypocrisy. And hypocrisy is to create a public impression that is at odds with one's real purposes or motivations. It's play acting. It's pretense. It's an outward show. It's the masking of an inward evil by an outward show or appearance of righteousness. Now, hypocrisy is rooted in a lack of trust of others. But it's part of building trust uh, in love is being honest. Uh, honest with our struggles, honest with our needs. When we're trying to hide something that we're internally struggling with, uh, it's because we don't think the people around us uh, is trustworthy enough or loves us enough to, to handle that with care or we're going to get hurt by them uh, or we want to make ourselves look better in front of them. We can't say that we're hurting or we're struggling with something uh, and thus we put on a fake show. That's hypocrisy. Uh, we are talking about uh, believers here. Uh, so it's anything that you have an outward impression that does not reflect your inward character or inward state. So uh, we need to not be hypocritical, but to be open and to be honest, to being able to trust enough to allow others to love us and to aid in us. The family can't help if the family doesn't know. And I can probably safely say that none of us is perfect. So we all have struggles. We all have things that we need help with and prayer with and accountability with. Uh, and thus, that's part of being a loving family. But hiding it, being a hypocrite, does not lend itself uh, to helping, having people help and pray you, for you and building that love. The next one is envy. And once again, it's plural, so it's acts of envy or envies. And the idea here is jealousy. It's a state of ill will towards someone else because of some real or perceived advantage that that person has or that person has experienced. It's the opposite of being thankful for, for good which comes to others. It's kind of the idea of, oh, if they got to go there or they got, a, they got this, a new car, how come I don't? It's, hey, that's fantastic. I'm glad God, God is blessing you. Wonderful. It's the attitude, being envious, or having envy here, acts of envy. It's an attitude of resenting another's prosperity. And that often leads to having a grudge, being bitter, and then turns into hatred and conflict. Uh, in a loving family, the prosperity of another is good for the whole family. And we rejoice with those who rejoice. And uh, we need to remember that these things are largely in the hands of God. Whether someone, well not largely, they are in the hands of God, whether someone prospers or not. Um, uh, so we need to uh, realize the sovereignty of God in these things as well. And not be envious, but be, be happy and rejoice with, with our fellow believers. The final one is all slander. Now, slander is any speech with harms and is intended to harm another person's status or reputation. It's the act of speaking ill of another. It's defamation and gossip. It's, it's this kind of speech does not build unity, but causes people to be excluded or be treated differently. Uh, this also arrogantly assumes that you don't have your own sin issues. Um, because I'm sure none of us would want other people to discuss our sin issues with other people so they can look down on us. Uh, so we definitely should not be doing it to anyone else. And once again, it's all kinds of slander. All kinds of, of evil uh, speech that tries to harm people. So, uh, putting these aside is part of purifying our lives. It's part of trying to reach that goal of brotherly love. And it's part of loving other people. Now, this, this list demonstrates uh, that which is contrary to a loving community. So, we should do the opposite. So now, remember that love is an expression of our desire for what is good and right of another for the glory of God. So, looking at the opposites 
of what is right and good for the other, we shouldn't have malice, we should have a gracious attitude towards people, viewing them with favor and trying to benefit them. We shouldn't be deceitful, trying to take advantage of people, but we should be people that are trustworthy. Uh, trustworthy in, in how we, uh, in our advice and things that we encourage or, or t communicate with other people. Hypocrisy. Uh, what is good and right is to be honest and be trusting of our fellow believers. We shouldn't be envious, but we should be thankful for others. And then we shouldn't have slander or slander other people, but we should be kind and have kind and edifying words. Now, these habits on this side of the page are usually used for self-protecting and self-aggrandizing. They're habits that we grew up with. It's habits of our old life. That's the way the world works. Uh, because we, uh, the world works on, uh, on status and on approval and dog eat dog and getting ahead and pushing others down. It's not the way the kingdom of God works. Not the way love works. So we need to abandon these as discarding pieces of clothing. They're, they're done. I'm done with it. I'm not wearing this. Not who I am. I don't want people to see that on me. Uh, we need to intentionally put those on. Those are not natural. But that's what we have chosen to do and to be when we became children of God. That's what our heart's longest desires are actually for. Uh, that kind of community. Okay, that's the first image. The second image speaks of what we should desire instead of, uh, instead of these things. Uh, and it uses the image of a newborn. Verses 2 through 3. Now the first part of the image speaks of uh, the newborn's desire for milk. Going back, it says, Therefore, like newborn babes, long for the pure milk of the word. Now, I left the therefore out because the main part of this verse is actually the command to long for pure milk uh, of the word. And so it's a therefore that connects that command with what came previously. So the therefore indicates uh, that these verses, which is one through three, it's all one big sentence in Greek, they naturally flow uh, after and follow the command to love. So if you think about our command to love, which is a, that expression and a desire for what is good and right of the other person for God's glory, how do we know what's right? How do we know what's good? If we are devoted to living a life, a holy life that's loving one another as God's children, we need to know how to do that. And thus, we need to long for the pure milk of the word. And that will instruct us and teach us and show us what is good and right for the other, for God's glory. How to love, and thus how to glorify God. So, the therefore connects the earlier image of you being born again from the seed of the word. So therefore, it's saying, uh, since you have been born again, well, just like a newborn baby, long for the pure milk of the word. Now, a newborn's longing for milk is the singular and dominant desire of that child's existence. It corresponds with their greatest need. Their life depends on it. And with it, the baby will be nourished and will grow. So also with a believer. The believer desires pure milk of the word instinctively, eagerly, and incessantly, continually. And only with it will a believer be nourished and grow. Uh, now, I want to make a disclaimer here. The image of milk in two other passages in the New Testament, in 1 Corinthians 3, 2 and Hebrews 5, 12 to 13, uh, use the image of milk in a different metaphor, where it contrasts milk and solid food, where it's saying there's certain believers, when you first became believers, you're immature. Like a baby, you can only handle milk. But you should have grown already and then handle meat, solid food. That's not what Peter's talking about here. Peter's using a different metaphor. He's emphasizing not on someone's spiritual maturity. He's, he's emphasizing on the same kind of desire that a baby has for milk. Uh, because what he's saying is this applies to all believers, no matter where, where you are in your maturity, uh, in, 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 your, in your walk with God. Uh, and we are all to desire 
And desire for what? It's the pure milk of the word. Now, there's much debate as far as the exact meaning of this phrase. Uh, because the term word here is a rare term that's only used here and in Romans 12.1. The term has a basic meaning. It's, the term is laikos. It is a form of lagos. Uh, and it means that which is pertaining to or characteristic of Lagos. Now, the word Lagos means word, matter, thought, reason. Uh, it's, Jesus is called the Lagos, the word, uh, in John 1.1. 1, 1. Uh, so, the term Lagos, there's been a few suggestions in commentaries in how people have taken it. One is that it's spiritual. You may have seen it in some of your translations. They should long for the pure spiritual milk. Uh, spiritual would mean that it's coming from God. This milk is coming from God. And, uh, but the term is logos. It's not pneuma, which is the word for spirit. And in fact, just a little bit later, next week, we're going to see that Peter uses spiritual temple and spiritual house. And he uses pneuma, not logos. Uh, or the uh, logikos. Uh, so that doesn't really seem to, to fit, and there's nowhere else where that term is, is translated spiritual. Okay, and the second option or, is metaphorical. It, it builds off of the idea of a spiritual word, but spiritual meaning not literal, but metaphor. So basically saying, long for the pure metaphorical word. Uh, sorry, metaphorical milk. Uh, but this seems awfully redundant. And it, is it really needed? Does anyone think that we're talking about literal? It doesn't seem to fit well. The next option is it, uh, logikos could mean rational, reasonable, or logical. Uh, but in what sense is milk reasonable or sensible or logical? It doesn't, that doesn't really seem to fit. Uh, but the other use, which is in Romans 12.1, that's where it does fit. So therefore, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, which is acceptable to God, which is your reasonable act of service. Or some translation says your spiritual act of service. Uh, that's where the only other place where, where uh, logic cost is used. It could mean, a lot of people say it means the word of God. Uh, which is the word logos. But again, we have to ask the question, well, why didn't Peter just use logos? He doesn't. He uses this term. Why did he change it? There has to be a reason for that. Uh, and we also have to realize that when Peter wrote this book, there was no New Testament. It wasn't there. Uh, there were some books, but it wasn't all of them. Uh, so in each of the previous uh, suggestions, there's elements that are true of it, uh, which suggests that the last one that I'm suggesting to you uh, and the commentators have suggested is, is more accurate. It's more of a general term. It's pertaining uh, to God's word. Meaning, it's pertaining to the truth of God, whether it's written, taught, discussed, sung, uh, preached, any way you can get it. It's the reality and truth of God uh, that's revealed to us in his word. And this best fits the context. Remember back in chapter, at the end of chapter 1, where it says, you've been born again through the living and enduring word of God. There, it's Lagos. And then, that's where Peter then quotes the Old Testament, and then he goes into verse 25, but the word of the Lord endures forever, which is part of the Old Testament, a quotation from Isaiah. And this is the word which has been preached to you. Now these two terms for word is, is rhema in Greek, and this is logos. But they all are connected. Uh, these are used synonymous right here in this own context, and really they are synonymous in Greek. Uh, so the context uh, speaks that these are, this is God's revelation. It's Anything that's pertained to God's revelation, that's what you need to uh, long for and desire. So the idea here in the image that's being presented is newborn physical life needs and has a built-in desire for physical nourishment from that moment of its life onward. So same is true. The newborn spiritual life needs and by design it's in there that they need to be nourished spiritually, from that time onward. So these are things pertaining to the revealed and communicated word of God, our only source of truth in life. Uh, and this is throughout God's word. Uh, Deuteronomy 8.3, he 
He humbled you and let you be hungry and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. This is what Jesus quotes when Satan tempts him to make the stones into bread. Uh, you don't, that's not the most important thing. Uh, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Uh, so our spiritual lives, our lives for God, we are dependent uh, on being nourished by God. Okay, now also notice that it, it's, it's, not just, it's not just the milk of things that pertain to the word of God, God's revelation, but it's the pure. It's described as being pure. Now, culturally, uh, children, newborns in milk, they were fed by either the mother's milk or a, a nursemaid. Rarely, if ever, did they use cow's milk. Uh, so when it's talking about being pure, it's in the, in the sense of being unmixed. There's no fillers. We might say it's organic. Uh, this was a clear, has a clear implication for pastors and teachers of Christ's church and for godly parents that are instructing and raising their children in the ways of the Lord. Leave out the fillers. Leave out the stories, the jokes, the poems, or anything else that takes away from and is not based on the truth of God. Because none of those other things can, can feed them spiritually. They won't grow them in their walk with God. Only God's word will do that. Uh, and, and that's why here we emphasize God's word. It, it's the only thing that can transform lives. It's the only thing we can say without a doubt that's true. Now, it is interesting also to note that the word purity, uh, a pure here, is a negative form of the word deceit in Greek. It's the same word, but it basically has an un in front of it. It's pure. And remember that the word for deceit means that taking advantage of someone by deceiving, by trickery, by falsehood, which gives the implication here that this pure milk, it gives a connotation that it's true and that it helps people. It doesn't take advantage of them. It adds to them. It builds them. It's good for them. It's for their advantage. Now, anything else that does not contain in or is based on God's truth will not nourish our spiritual lives. Why? It's because it's, if it's not from God, it's from a different source. It's from the world. And it can't. So that's the, the newborn's desire for milk. Now, we need to also know before we move on that Peter doesn't command here that the believer must study the word or read it or memorize it or, or meditate on it, uh, which are essential practices uh, or, or anything else like that. He goes back to the foundational desire of man to do so. When we desire the things of God, like newborn babies desire milk, then all those other things will follow. It's our heart condition. Now, you may ask, well, how can he command a desire? How, how is that possible? You know, I feel what I feel. Or I want what I want. Well, we desire what we hold as being valuable and good. I'll just give you a short example. Have you ever driven by a restaurant and said, oh, man, that place looks like a dump. I'm never going there. And then someone says, wow, I just visited that restaurant. And wow, I had the best whatever I've ever had. Hmm. Your value, your opinion their value and your opinion of them and what was good may have changed and your mind may have changed your desire may be oh okay oh, I think I'll try that I like those and then go uh, and that's why here in scriptures the truth about the value and what is good in the word of God it should give us that desire and change our heart alright the second part of the image is the purpose for consuming uh, the pure milk of the word which is the newborn's growth from milk he continues to say, Therefore, like newborn babes, long for the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. By it, meaning God's revealed truth, uh, which, remember, God's revealed truth has saved us, has delivered us from sin, from deception, from darkness, and from death. And when we are born again, we're not perfect, but we are now going in a different direction. We are purifying our lives in obedience to God's truth. So our motivation for genuine spiritual growth arises 
out of a righteous sense of discontent in our imperfect state. Uh, we hate sin in our failings. And we desire to be satisfied uh, and to live righteously in holy lives. Uh, and nothing else will satisfy that except for God's word. I mean, how, how many of us uh, d does something you know, during the week and say, oh, I wish I didn't do that. wish I hadn't said that. Uh, and uh, I wish my heart was different. That's what Paul struggles with in Romans 7. But the answer in Romans 8 was to be led by the Spirit and not by the flesh. And so we have to continually take in God's Word to, to long for it uh, so that we can continually battle with the flesh and be led by the Spirit. Jesus said in John 8.31, uh, so Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed Him, if you continue in my Word, then... You are truly disciples of mine. And you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. It is a characteristic of a believer. It's one of the key features of being saved. Assurance is that you have a love for God's word, for God's scripture, because that is your avenue towards, to God, to, to know God, to love him, and to hear about him more. Uh, and that more you know of the truth, the more you'll be set free from sin and its destruction and harm in your life. So striving to eliminate sins and being free from, its, uh, from sin is a prerequisite for sustaining the desire for God's word. If we cling to sins, that's going to drive us in the opposite direction. Because the truth of scriptures, his word is revealed the truth. It exposes that we're wrong and we need to change. And it confronts sin and it demands righteousness. Uh, so, if our desire is that way, we will view that as being great. If our desire is not there, we're going to run from it. Because we don't want to show where we're wrong. So, as children of God, uh, we long to be nourished and to, be, and to grow. So, the love for and delight in God's word always marks uh, the truly saved. Now, the third and final part of the infant image is the newborn's experience of milk. Therefore, long for the pure milk of the word if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. The metaphor of tasting uh, has the idea of to experience something. It's used that way throughout the scripture. If you've tasted it, you've experienced it. It's part of what you've lived. And here it's experiencing the kindness or goodness of the Lord. Uh, when that term is used of food, if we continue the metaphor with the milk, it means delicious. Uh, it's something that's, the food has been, del it's delicious. If you've tasted the delicious uh, kindness uh, of the Lord. Uh, so that experience, the goodness of God, is something that you've experienced a moment of salvation and thus have experienced it since. Uh, but that goodness of salvation is preeminent and it's that taste that delicious taste, that wonderful taste, that uh, an experience is something that we want more of. It is something that our, our hearts and our lives long for the most. Uh, and by using this language, Peter is actually alluding to Psalm 34, verse 8, which says, Oh, oh taste and see that the Lord is good, and how blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. And in the context of Psalm 34, the Lord provides all of our needs, uh, all the needs of those who seek him. Now here, when it says the if, it's building an argument based on a presumed reality. Uh, so we could say, since, since you've tasted the kindness of the Lord, then therefore you should be yearning for it. It's not wrong. Please desire it with all your heart, like, like a newborn babe, the, the things of God. But if some that are reading this or hearing this letter uh, is not, have not tasted, experienced the goodness of the Lord, is not saved, uh, they won't long for this. And they won't long for his word. And if they fabricate that longing, it won't cause that growth because they are not receiving from God. Now, people can long for scriptural truth, for details, for grammar, for history, for culture, uh, and other such things, but they don't necessarily will have a life transformation that follows by its power, by the power of the word of God. They, and thus... They might gain knowledge, but they won't have life transformation that glorifies God. Paul wrote 
about some false teachers that they were always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And in Romans 10, it says, Brethren, my heart desires and my prayer to God for them, talking about Jewish people as fellow Israelis, for their salvation. For I testify about them that they have a zeal for God. They have a great desire and they're, they're diving into the, the scriptures and the things of God, but not in accordance with knowledge. They don't know Christ. They don't know God. They're looking at the information, but they don't know the source of the information, the God behind it. For not knowing uh, about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. Uh, this is God's offer of salvation. Not that you can work or do anything enough good to be approved by God, but that He's given it to you through Christ. Uh, and, and if, and that's part of salvation, us surrendering our, our efforts, right? And just having faith. Verse 4, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Uh, we do no longer have to follow the law to be approved by God. We follow His laws because we have already been approved because we believed and we turned to Him. So those are the two images uh, that speak about how we, we grow in holiness through love. Now, holiness of growing in love requires that we discard those things in life which hinder our love for others. Is there malice? Is there deceit? Is there hypocrisy, envy, or slander in your heart? You know your, your, your lives and what you're thinking and what goes on, and is that something that's happening in you? If you are born again into God's family and thus devoted to brotherly love, these, these must be laid aside. Number two, in taking the opposite of these negative qualities, we can see how the Father expects His community to live. We need to be gracious towards one another. People who are trustworthy, honest and trusting of each other, being thankful for the successes of others, and surrounded by kind and edifying words. Remember, these are not natural to us. Uh, the former list is, we must intentionally implement these into our lives. The holiness of, of growing in love requires that we have a singular and driving desire for the truth of God. Uh, this is the only source that will nourish our spiritual lives and cause us to grow. If we have experienced God's kindness and salvation, why wouldn't we want more of Him? Consuming more of His truth reveals to us what is right and what is good, which we need in order to love others and to purify our lives from sin that we hate. And finally, those who are teaching and instructing others in the ways of the Lord need to give God's precious people His pure, unmixed truth. God's Word is the only means for salvation and for growth. And that is how Peter has taught us about the holiness of growing in love.